طيب بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. I believe that the last thing that we took from this great Imam in his book on the Fiqh pertaining to the ever so important rulings of fasting, uh, we spoke about the issues of those who were allowed not to fast and they would have to make the fast up later. And the last people, the last group of people that we spoke about were the women that are, are on menstruation or the women that are experiencing um, the first, experiencing postnatal bleeding. The third of these categories that the Imam is talking about who do not have to fast but have to make it up later, the Imam he says, al thalith al hamil wal murdi'. The third of this category are the ones that are pregnant or the breastfeeding. So the woman that is pregnant or the breastfeeding due to the weakening that can be caused to the mother or child or both of them, right? So the author, he said, إِذَا خَافَتَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمَا أَفْتَرَتَ وَقَدَرْتَ If they fear for themselves some type of weakness or harm, then they are allowed not to fast, they break their fast, they don't fast, and they make those days up. So they are treated like the ruling of the sick person, the one who is temporarily sick, and it's difficult for them to fast. They don't have to fast, but they have to make it up later. The author, he says, وَإِنْ خَافَتَ عَلَىٰ وَلَدَيْهِمَا أَفْتَرَتَ وَقَدَرْتَ وَأَطْعَمَتَ أَنْ كُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِسْكِينَ However, if it's the situation where they fear only for the child and not for themselves, the fear is for the child alone, that some harm may come to the child when the woman is pregnant or the woman is breastfeeding if she fasts, then in this situation they do not have to fast, they make up the fast, but at the same time they have to feed a poor person for each day that they missed from the fasting in this situation. Uh, the feeding who's in charge of the feeding, who's responsible to do the feeding, it's the person that is responsible for the mother and for the child. So in most cases, it would be the husband. The husband is the one responsible to pay for the feeding of the days which are missed in this situation where the woman is not fasting due to fearing for the health of the child. طيب. Uh, the author, he says, وَإِن صَامَتَ أَجْزَأْهُمَا وَإِن صَامَتَ أَجْزَأْهُمَا However, if the woman who is pregnant or breastfeeding does fast, then the fasting, of course, is going to be valid for them. So being pregnant and breastfeeding is not something which causes your fast to be invalidated or for you to leave out your fast. As we explained, the only time you leave out the fast is if you find that it's causing you some kind of harm or it's causing the child harm or it's causing both of you harm. So in this situation, uh, you can leave the fasting, but if it doesn't cause you harm, then you can go ahead and fast uh, the pregnant woman and the breastfeeding woman and the fast is valid and accepted. Al-Rabi' The fourth category that the Imam is talking about here Al-Ajiz an yisawm li kibrin aw maradin la yurja bur'uhu The fourth category of people who are allowed not to fast but they have to make it up at a later time or in general they have to make it up at a later time but not this particular category. So all the other three categories from the one who is sick temporary sickness from the one who is traveling, from the one who is pregnant or breastfeeding, these people, they have to make it up again uh, at a later time, as does the one who is on menstruation. Uh, but this fourth category is a little bit different. Al-Aj is an insom, the one who is unable to fast due to kibr, due to old age, al maradin la yurja bur'uhu, or due to a sickness, which is a continual sickness, uh, a terminally ill, a sickness where the person, it's not likely that the person is going to be cured. Of course, the future of whether one is not going to be cured or not, that is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if all of the doctors on the earth, they come together and they tell you that it's impossible for you to be cured, you can still be cured by the permission of Allah azza wa jal, by making dua to him, by giving charity, by seeking cure from zamzam water and other ways, as mentioned by the scholars in Islam. So when we say here that this is a sickness which is not going to be cured, we mean this on the face value because all sicknesses can be cured by the permission of Allah. So if a person is too old and weak that they cannot fast or they have a sickness which is a terminal type of sickness like cancer or something of that nature, may Allah protect us, then these people, they don't have to fast. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُطِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَمُ مِسْكِينَ and upon those who find the fasting extremely difficult or they are unab unable to fast, then they pay in place of fasting, they pay to feed a poor person for each day that they are not fasting. 
And so this is explained by the great scholar from the companions radiallahu anhum, Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhum, the cousin of the Prophet sallallahu the one who was known as Turjuman al-Quran, the one who was known as the explainer of the Quran. He said in the Athar, in the narration uh, collected by Imam al qutni and the Isnad, the uh, narration is authentic. Ibn Abbas, he said, Rukhisa li shaykh al-Khabir, Rukhisa li shaykh al-Kabir, and yuftira wa yut'ima an kulli yawm al-miskin, wa la qada alayhi. It's been permitted, permission has been granted for the old man or woman who are unable to fast and they find it extremely difficult that they can feed for each person, for each day that they do not fast, a poor person. And there's no need for them to make up the fast thereafter. And of course, added to this category are also the sick people that it's said to them that your sickness is not likely to be cured. Okay, so the sickness which is to be uh, considered a terminal sickness. So these people, what they do? That these people, in the place of them not fasting for every day, they do not fast, they feed a poor person. So what is it that they feed a poor, poor person? It's said that they feed a poor person a mud, a mud of burr. A mud of wheat. Mud is that you get your two hands like so and you cup it together and you gather as much wheat as you can in the two hands. So that amount of mud, that amount of bur, wheat, is to be fed to a poor person which is around half a kilogram. Or you can do nisf sa'a, nisf sa'a of other food items like dates. Nisf sa'a comes to about one and a half kilograms roughly. Okay, so it's either going to be half a kilogram of wheat or it's going to be other food items like date, which is around a kilo and a half, uh, roughly. And uh, Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy upon him, he said you can in fact feed a person a common meal which is, which is eaten uh, during the day. So any, anything which is common in the country of the people that you are feeding and is accepted as a common meal, then you can feed that meal for the poor person for each day that you did not fast if you were uh, elderly and if you were terminally sick. طيب, the feeding done in this situation, it shouldn't be done before the month because that means that you are putting this, the, uh, the act of worship before the suburb, before the reason for the act of worship. So this feeding is an act of worship, right? It can only be done after the fasting has been missed. So you either do it, you miss a day and then you feed the person the day after or you wait till the end of the month and then you feed 30 people or 29 people for the amount of fasts that you have missed. The author, he says, وَعَلَى سَائِرِ مَنْ أَفْتَرَى الْقَضَاءُ لَا غَيْرُ And everybody else, except from the, apart from the ones that we mentioned, okay, the four categories of people that we mentioned that were allowed not to fast and they could make it up later, or the, specifically the last category where we said that the person uh, doesn't have to fast because they're too old, that they can in fact feed a person in the place of fasting. Now the author says, everybody else apart from these categories who breaks their fast, then upon them is only to make up the day and nothing else. Okay, so say for example somebody who decides for whatever reason he doesn't want to fast in one of the days of Ramadan, then this person, there's nothing upon them, there's no fidya, all they have to do, there's no kafara, all they have to do is make up their fast, and of course they have to make tawbah to Allah Azawajal for having broken their fast without a valid reason. The author he said, إِلَّا مَنْ أَفْتَرَ بِجِمَاعٍ فِي الفرج. The author now is going to give an exception to the rule that he just mentioned. So he just mentioned to us that anybody outside of the four categories that we previously took, if they do not fast, then all they have to do is make up the fast at another time, right? So the author he now says, except for the one who breaks their fast due to having sexual intercourse in the farj, in the private part. So this is from one of the biggest wrongdoings that a person can do in the month of Ramadan. Okay, when they're supposed to be fasting, they're supposed to leave alone their food and their drink and their sexual desires for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if they have sexual intercourse, and intercourse is detailed by the scholars as being, and sorry to be explicit, it means that when the private part of the male enters the private organ of the woman, whether it's the front or the back. Okay, so any, uh, if the private part of the male enters the front passage or the back passage, this is known as intercourse. Every other type of sexual um, activity wherein the man or woman ejaculates, okay, or they do not ejaculate outside of entering into the private parts, is known as mubashara. It's known as mubashara. And it doesn't take the rulings of the rulings of sexual intercourse, the rulings of jima'ah. 
So the author he's saying that except for the one that has sexual intercourse, this person has committed a major sin and this person is going to have to do an expiation from the greatest of expiations that are found in the Sharia. Before we go into that, there are some considerations to discuss. The first of them, if the inzal, if the ejaculation takes place, not through the, um, not through the private passage, not through the vagina, but it takes place through like the thighs, for example, then in this situation, there's no kafara, there's no expiation, there's no penalty that needs to be paid, but rather toba needs to be made, and that that fasting day will be need to make, has to be made up again at a later time. The reason there's no expiation in this particular situation is because this was not a complete intercourse in the way that we previously described. Another consideration, if the woman who is partner to the, the wife of the husband, if she was forgetful or she was forced, then there's no kafara upon her. All she has to do is to make up the, the fast. However, if she was a willing participant, then she is going to have to do the penalty like the man has to do the penalty. The author, he says, so the person who has sexual intercourse in the front in the vagina or the back passage so this person he has to make up and she has to make up the fast excuse me and as well as making up the fast they have to first free a slave if they cannot find the slave to be freed then they have to fast two consecutive months if they are unable to fast two consecutive months for valid sharia reasons uh, then they have to feed 60 poor people. فَإِنْ لَمْ يَجِدْ And if they don't find the ability to, fight, to feed 60 poor people, سَقَطَتْ عَنْهُ Then all of these penalties are then removed from this person. Look how, subhanahu wa ta'ala, look how merciful Allah Azza wa is. Even in the situation when you have done a major sin, and there's a major penalty upon you to pay, if you are unable to free a slave, and if you are unable to fast two months consecutively, if you are unable to find the wealth to feed 60 people, then this penalty is removed from you. So this is taken from the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu, says, بَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ جُلُوسًا in the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa That day when we were sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِذْجَاءَهُ رَجُمْ فَقَالْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهَ لَكْتُ A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهَ I have destroyed myself. قال ما لك the Prophet said to him, what, 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 what do you mean? What have you done? The, the man, he said, وَقَعْتُ عَلَىٰ إِمْرَأَتِي وَأَنَا صَائِمٌ He said, I fell upon my wife, meaning I had sexual intercourse with her, whilst I was fasting. The Prophet said, هَلْ تَجِدْ رَقَبَا تُعْتِقُهَا Do you find a slave that you can free? The man said, no. So the Prophet said, هَلْ تَسْتَطِعْ أَنْ تَسُومَ شَهْرَيْ مُتَتَابِعِينَ Can you fast two months consecutively? The man, he said, no. The Prophet ﷺ said, هَلْ تَجِدُ إِطْعَمُ سِتِينَ مِسْكِينَ Do you find the ability to, find, to feed 60 poor people? The man said, no. فَمَكَثَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ فَبَيْنَمَا نَحْنُ عَلَىٰ ذَلِكَ أُتِيَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ بِعَلَقٍ فِيهَا تَمَرٍ So the Prophet ﷺ, after speaking to the man, he sat for a while waiting. And whilst the people were waiting to see what would happen, it was brought to the Prophet ﷺ, a container of dates. So the Prophet ﷺ, he called the man that had this issue, that had this problem of having, um, you know, had sexual intercourse with his wife whilst he was fasting in Ramadan. He called the man and he gave the man the food and he said, فَتَصَدَّقْ بِهِ He gave the, the dates and the food to the man. He said, go ahead and distribute this amongst the poor as a penalty for what you have done. So the man, he said, فَقَالَ الرَّجْلِ أَعْلَى أَفْقَرَ مِنْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ فَوَاللَّهِ مَا بَيْنَ لَا بَتَيْهَا أَهْلَ بَيْتٍ أَفْقَرَ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ So the man, he said, Oh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is nobody poorer than me in this region, in Medina, that I can give the sadaqah to. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam laughed at him and he said, take the food for yourself and for your family. So the thing that we take from this hadith is first and foremost, what is the penalty of the one who does this act in Ramadan? The penalty is that first and foremost, they have to find a slave to free. If they're unable to find a slave to free, then they have to fast two consecutive months. If they're unable to fast two consecutive months, then they have to find the ability to feed 60 poor people, right? And also we take from the hadith, the mercy of the Prophet ﷺ when he saw that the man was extremely poor and he needed the food for him and his, for himself and his family. The Prophet ﷺ smiled and laughed at him and he said, go on your way, feed yourself and your family. طيب. 
the two months which are to be fasted, they have to be consecutive. And if they are broken, if any one day from the 60 days, the two months is missed due to a non-valid Sharia reason, then the person would have to start the two months again from the beginning. So say, for example, the person has got to day 58. There's only one or two days left. And the person decides that, you know, on day 58, I've had enough, I'm going to take a break. In this situation now, the person will have to restart the fasting again from day zero, from day one. Okay? However, if it was a situation that there was a valid Sharia excuse, excuse, like the person had to travel for an emergency, or the person had menstruation, or the person uh, was extremely sick, or something of that nature, then this is allowed, and the day and the, the the days that they have to fast will just continue once their excuse is removed. And the 60 people, they can be fed in one go. They can be fed in one go. So the author, he says, فَإِن جَامْعَ وَلَمْ يُكَفِّرْ حَتَّى جَامْعَ ثَانِيَا فَكَفَارَةٌ وَاحِدًا If the person is in a strange situation where, for example, he has sexual intercourse, but then he doesn't give the expiation until he has another sexual intercourse with his wife, then there will only be one kafara. Okay, so this is in a situation where a person has sexual intercourse with his wife twice and the penalty has not been given for the first sexual intercourse then the person will have to give only one penalty only one penalty even though two sexual intercourses took place in one day why is that? they make a deductive analogy qiyas based upon the one for example who breaks their fast by eating so this person has broken their fast on the one day by eating then eats again a second time or a third time so regardless of how many times the person eats in one day, they only have to make up one fast. Likewise here, if the person has sexual intercourse in a day in Ramadan, and they don't expiate for that sexual intercourse, and they fall into sexual intercourse again, then it's only one expiation for no matter how many times they had sexual intercourse in that day, as long as the expiation was not given. But had they had one sexual intercourse and they made expiation, then they had the next, another sexual intercourse on the same day, then a second expiation would have to be given in the same day. The author, he says, وَإِن كَفَرَ ثُمَّ جَامَعَ فَكَفَارَةٌ ثَانِيَةٌ Like I just mentioned, that if the person, he made expiation, and then again, again had sexual intercourse, maybe this person is newly married, then there will be a kafara thaniya. There will be a second kafara, a second expiation for the second act. So each time the person has intercourse, right, the person would need to make an expiation. However, if there was more than one intercourse in one day and no expiation was made except until the end of those acts, then one expiation would suffice and cover for all of the acts that took place on that day. Another further situation, if the intercourse took place on one day and there was no expiation, and then again on another day and there was no expiation so for each day a separate expiation needs to take place in this situation why because each day is a separate act of worship the author he says and everybody who is upon them to have imsak if you remember what the meaning of imsak is to withhold right to act as though you are fasting even though you are in reality not fasting who do this fall under this is like the one who returns from traveling. This is like the one who the menstruation has stopped before Maghrib. So all of these people, the excuses for them not to fast have been removed whilst the day of Ramadan remains. So they have to act as though they are now fasting. They have to refrain from the things which break the fast. So the author, he said, وَكُلُّ مَنْ لَزِمَهُ الْإِمْسَاكِ فِي رَمَضَانِ فَجَامَعَ فَعَلَيْهِ كَفَارًا So everybody who's in that situation of making imsak, if they still have sexual intercourse, if they have sexual intercourse, then the kafara is also upon them, even though they are not truly fasting. The kafara is also upon them due to the sanctity of the month being transgressed. So they also have to pay a penalty. <clears throat> um, if one was traveling and they had intercourse while they were traveling, then this person, there's no kafara upon them, okay? All they have to do is that they have to make up the fast. Why is there a different ruling here? So the one who is traveling has permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to fast aslan, not to fast at all, right? The one who is traveling has permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to fast. 
However, this person decides that I'm going to fast regardless. I'm not going to take the concession from Allah Azawajal. I'm going to tr fast while I'm traveling. However, in the middle of the travel, at whatever point in the travel, the person decides that they're going to break their fast and they do this by having a sexual relationship with their wife. So in this situation, the person has broken the fast, but they don't have to pay the penalty because they were in a situation where they originally did not have to fast. And the scholars like Sheikh Abdul Salam al they said there's a rule here, man jaza lahu al-iftar jaza lahu an yuftira bima sha'a min al-mufattarat. That whoever it was permitted for not to fast, then it's permitted for them to break their fast with anything that they so wish, in any way that they so wish. طيب. If one is making up a fast outside of the month of Ramadan, right? Obviously, they've got a fast to make up, so they're making it up outside of the month of Ramadan. And in that fast, when they are making it up, they have a sexual relationship, they have jima, right? Here, there is no kafara required. What is required is toba and to make that day up again. Why is there no kafara required? There's no expiation required from the three things that we mentioned because it's not in the month of Ramadan. It's making up a fast from the days of Ramadan, but outside of the month of Ramadan. So all they have to do is make up the fast and they have to make tawbah to Allah The author, he says, وَمَنْ أَخَرَ الْقَضَى لِعُذْرٍ حَتَّى أَدْرَكَهُ رَمَضَانْ آخر فَلَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ غَيْرُهُ That whoever whoever uh, has fast to make up, however, they do not make up those fasts until the next Ramadan comes because they excuse, they have a valid excuse, like they had to travel for long periods of time or they were sick for long periods of time. So this person was unable to make up the fast from the previous Ramadan and now the next Ramadan has come upon them. So there's nothing upon them except that they have to make up their fasts whenever they are able to do so, right? وَإِنْ فَرَّطَ أَطْعَمَ مَا مَعَ الْقَضَاءِ لِكُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِسْكِينَ However, if the, case, if the person made tafrit, if the person was lazy and careless and didn't make enough effort to make up the fast until the next Ramadan came, then in this situation, the person not only has to make up the fast, but they also have to pay a penalty, which is feeding a poor person for each day that they still had left to make up uh, in this situation. So, in general, a person who has fasts to make up from a previous Ramadan, they can take whatever time they want to make it up as long as it's done before the next Ramadan. Okay? As long as they know that they are able to do it before the next Ramadan. So we have in this the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim of Aisha radiallahu anha where she said, قالت كان يكون علي صوم رمضان فما أستطيع أن أقضيه إلا في شعبان أشغل برسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. I used to have fasts from from Ramadan that I had to make up. But I couldn't make them up until the following year in the month of Sha'ban, which precedes Ramadan. Uh, it's only then that I could make them up because I was busy serving the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So here she, was, she had a valid excuse and she was unable to make the fast up, but she did make them up before the next Ramadan. But if a person doesn't make them up before the next Ramadan and they don't have a valid Sharia excuse, then not only do they have to make those days up, but with each day they have to pay uh, to feed a poor person for each day that they still had to make up. And this is a fatwa give, given by many of the companions. The author he says, However, if a person has fasts to make up and he's unable to make them up for a valid excuse, like the person is traveling or the person was sick, and then the person dies, so there's nothing in this situation upon the person. Okay? So in this situation, the person wasn't being careless, the person wasn't being lazy, it was just that he was busy with a valid excuse. The person was either sick or the person, would either, for example, was traveling and they didn't manage to make up their fasts and death came upon them. In this situation, there is nothing upon the person. However, if it was a situation wherein the person didn't make up these fasts, uh, not based upon a valid reason, the person was just lazy and then death came upon them. In this situation, then for each day that the person missed, his family members would have to feed a poor person on his behalf for each fast that he missed. So the majority of the scholars, they say, you can't fast on behalf of this person, the person that has passed away, right? Because you couldn't fast on his behalf when they were alive. Likewise, in death, you can't fast on their behalf. Thus, you have to feed a person on their behalf instead for each fast that they missed. 
the author he said إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ صَوْمُ مَنْظُورًا فَإِنَّهُ يُصَامَ عَنْهُ unless it was a fast that the person had to make up the, this fast was a fast of a vow that the person vowed to Allah Azza wa Jal that if this happens I vow to fast such and such number of days so if it was a fast that was made in the situation of a vow then this fast should be fasted on his behalf in Bukhari Muslim we have the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha where she said that the Prophet وسلم, said Man ma صيام, whoever dies and upon him is fasting that he had made due to a vow then his close uh, relatives should fast on his behalf then the close relatives should fast on his behalf so why is this different to the previous case of the one who died without completing the fast of Ramadan the difference is that in this situation the Sharia did not obligate the fast upon the person this is something the person obligated upon themselves by making a vow and when you make a vow to Allah جل, it has to be fulfilled so it's highly recommended that if it's known that the person died and they had uh, fasts which were made from a vow it's highly recommended that the close family members they make up that fast for that person the author he says and likewise also every other type of uh, righteous deed that the person had vowed to do so if a person vowed to go on hajj and the person died before they could do that hajj then the family members they should do it on his behalf if they are able to do so the author he now moves on to the very important section where he says He's going to now talk about the matters which break the fast and the asul of what breaks the fast, the foundations, uh, the principles, the foundations, the pillars of what break the fast are three. The first of them is jima', sexual intercourse because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah It's permissible for you once the night has come to have intercourse, to have relationships with your wife. So obviously the proof from this verse is that you cannot have it in the day because Allah is permitting it to happen in the night. So sexual intercourse breaks the fast. And also eating and drinking because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Eat and drink until the thread, the white thread of the dawn is differentiated to you from the white thread of the night at the time of Fajr and then continue your fasting until the night comes upon you until Maghrib comes upon you so in this verse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned eat and drink until dawn comes upon you until Fajr comes upon you so obviously eating and drinking is not permissible and other matters are that which is added by the sunnah or added by the scholars wherein they made ijtihad they exerted their efforts looking into the evidences and they added some other matters to that which breaks the fast but the fundamental things are the three that we mentioned sexual intercourse and eating and drinking the author he said Woman akala aw shariba. whoever eats or drinks breaks their fast now eating and drinking what is considered as eating and drinking anything which passes through the mouth and goes into the stomach whether it is beneficial nourishing or not nourishing even if it is harmful so anything which has substance okay not like air substance it has and it goes through the mouth to the uh, internal organs of the body whether it's nourishing or not whether it's harmful or not then this is considered eating or drinking however for the ruling of eating and drinking to stand in terms of it breaking your fast the following needs to be considered also that the person did this knowingly not the situation where a person gets up from an afternoon nap and is a bit dizzy unaware forgets that they are fasting and has a quick sip of water in this situation the fast does not break because it was done forgetfully it was not done knowing and so the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith in Bukhari man akala nasyan wa huwa sa'imun fal yutimma sawmuhu fa innama at'amahu allahu wa saqahu whoever eats or drinks out of forgetfulness then this person should continue with their fast for verily it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that fed him or gave him to drink so if you do this unknowingly you eat or drink forgetfully then it's not written for you that you have broken your fast you just continue with your fast but you don't finish the pizza you stop as soon as you realize that what you are doing is something that you shouldn't be doing and also what's to be considered is the person is not compelled the person is not being forced like a prisoner is forced to eat in many horrific situations so we have the hadith collected by Imam Ibn Majah and others 
where the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Allah tajawaza an ummati al khata wa nisyan wa mastukrihu alayhi. That verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has overlooked from my nation that which was done by mistake or that which was done by, out of forgetfulness or that which they were compelled to do. So these matters, that which were, you were done out of forgetfulness or by mistake or you compelled to do it, then this is overruled and there's nothing upon the person for this. Also, the last thing to consider is there should be knowledge of the ruling. The person should know that what they are doing breaks their fast. For example, if a person is a new Muslim or a person lived in the communist lands where they had no exposure to the true teachings of Islam and the person just didn't know the rulings, then in this situation the person will be excused. Not the person who had access to Muslims uh, and had access to the Muslim, uh, to the Islamic knowledge, which basically applies to most people because today we have the internet, then these people are not excused. Excuse me. The author, he says, the other thing which breaks the fast, أو إستعطى إستعطى means to take something through the nose that will reach the internal stomach. You put something through the nose, medication or the like, and it reaches the stomach, this breaks the fast. Why? Because in the hadith of Luqid ibn Subra, the Prophet ﷺ said, بَالِكْ فِي الْإِسْتِنْشَاقِ إِلَّا أَنْ تَكُونَ صَائِمًا Exaggerate in taking water in your nose when you make wudu unless you are fasting. Why? Unless you are fasting because it's possible that it will go through your nose into your stomach. So the Prophet ﷺ said, don't exaggerate when you are fasting. So anything which goes through the nose, uh, then this will cause the fasting to be broken. And from this is like when a person has the, um, those internal cameras that are tube-like, they go through your nose at times and it goes down through your throat. This would also break the fast because it's gone through the nose and it's past the throat, going into the internal organs of the human being, which then breaks the fast. The author, he said, <laughs> The author, the author, he says, anything which goes into the internal organs, into the body, the jof, the jof is what is below the throat. Anything which is below the throat or anything which is covered uh, from the head, like for example, the nose, um, once it's gone inside the nose and to the depths towards the throat, then this is known as the jof. This is known as the internal um, things where if something goes in, it breaks the fast. So the author is saying anything which goes into the jof, which goes into the internal organs of the body, leading to the stomach and the intestines, whether it's from the mouth, the ears, the eyes, or any other way, then any type of food and drink that goes in, or anything which has substance, then it will break the fast. The author, he said, أو استسقاء أو استقاء Or the person, the person استقاء Bismillah The person, he sought to intentionally vomit. The person sought to intentionally vomit. So we have that in the hadith collected by Imam Abu Dawood, Imam Tirmidhi and others where the Prophet Sallallahu said, as narrated by Abu Huraira, مَنْ دَرَعُ الْقَيْ فَلَا قَضَاءَ عَلَيْهِ وَمَنْ استَقَاءَ فَعَلَيْهِ الْقَضَاءَ Whoever is overcome by vomit, then there is no making up that fast for the person, meaning the fasting is not deemed as having broken. But whoever causes themselves to vomit, then this person has to make up their fast. So you cause yourself to vomit by looking at something which is going to horrify you, and you know it's going to do that, it will cause you to vomit, or you put your fingers down your throat, and it's going to cause you to vomit. So in this situation, your fast is going to be broken. But if it was the case that you were overcome by vomit, it wasn't done intentionally, then this doesn't break your fast unless it comes up to your throat and you swallow it. If it came up to your throat and you swallowed the vomit back down, then in this situation, it would break your fast. Awistamna, the author, he said, this also breaks the fast when the person, uh, man or woman, causes themselves to ejaculate, uh, causing themselves to have an ejaculation of uh, semen, O Madhi. Semen O Madhi. Madhi, uh, money is semen. Everybody knows what semen is. That's money. Madhi is the fluid, sticky fluid which comes out at the time of sexual arousal. It's not the same as semen, but it comes out at the time of sec sexual arousal. I think it's called prostatic fluid, something of that nature. So, anyway, if somebody does istimna where they try to uh, make themselves ejaculate, um, sperm or this uh, madhi which I just explained, then in this situation their fasting is going to be broken. The reason that is because as we mentioned in the beginning, the person is supposed to leave off their sexual desires for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it's in a situation that this person was trying to ejaculate, but however the, the ejaculation didn't actually take place, 
the liquid didn't come out from the private part, but they felt the moving of the liquid, then in this situation they will take the same ruling as though they have ejaculated, even though nothing came out. They will still have to take the ghusl, and they will still have to make the fast again, and they will have to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one who has a wet dream, in this situation, uh, the person uh, doesn't have to the one who has the wet dream in this situation, the person doesn't have to uh, make up the fast because they didn't do it uh, with their intention. It happened uncontrollably to them, right? It wasn't done by their choice. The author, he said, In the situation where the person kisses or he touches or she touches, so they ejaculate, whether it's sperm ejaculation or it's that madhi, which is the sticky fluid which, when, which comes out when a person is aroused. So in this situation when the person kisses or the person touches, okay, and it causes the person to ejaculate any of these two matters, the, the sperm or the pro, prostatic fluid, then the person's fast is broken. Okay? However, if the person is going to kiss, like a kiss of rahmah, uh, a kiss of mercy when like the wife kisses the husband or the husband kisses the wife is not due to sexual arousal that type of kissing it's just due to mercy you're happy to see your husband you're happy to see your wife in this situation this doesn't lead to much arousal and nothing's going to happen this kind of kissing is allowed why because Aisha radiallahu anha our mother she mentions in Bukhari that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa used to kiss and he used to uh, touch his wives whilst he was fasting however he was the most able of you to control himself so the hadith is teaching us that if you're able to control yourself that is not going to lead to uh, the arousal of the sexual desires which cause you to ejaculate either money or money then it's fine for you to kiss and to touch though it's better to leave the author he says if it's the case that the person uh, is looking at something which causes them to have sexual arousal to the extent that they ejaculate they're looking at something that causes them to have sexual arousal to the to the state or to the point where they ejaculate then this also breaks their fast okay but not if madhi comes out only if money comes out in this situation of looking if you ejaculate sperm then uh, the man or the woman then in this situation the fast is broken but if you ejaculate madhi which is that sticky uh, liquid uh, prostatic fluid which comes out before uh, sexual intercourse, then this is not uh, to be considered as breaking the fast. The author he says, or hajama or ihtajama, or the person he does the hijama or he has the hijama done to him or her, has cupping done to them, or they have or they themselves are doing the cupping to another person. The Prophet said in the hadith in Abi Dawood, after al Hajj wal Mahjum. The person who's having the, the cupping done to them or is doing the cupping, both of them have broken their fasting. Now, this ruling is not carried over to the ruling of uh, donating blood, for example. Why? Because this act of work, this act, uh, the hijama, the cupping, the ulama, they don't know what the illa is for this. They don't know what the reasoning is for this ruling to be given. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever ha is doing the cupping or whoever has cupping done, then the fast is broken. But the ulama, they were unable to find the illa. They were unable to find the cause for this ruling. That's why they cannot make qiyas, they cannot make deductive analogy to other things which are similar, like the giving of blood. So it only specifically applies to cupping, but not to giving your blood, donating your blood. The author, he said, rules that we need to consider as I've previously mentioned for things to be invalidating the fast is that it's amidan, that is done on purpose dhakiran, that is done whilst the person knew what they were doing the person, remem the person remembered that they were fasting fasada sawmuhu, fasada sawmuhu so all the things that we mentioned which break the fast they're done with the considerations that we mentioned previously that the person has to know what they were doing the person has to be aware, not forgetful the person shouldn't be compelled uh, then in this situation what the author has mentioned from the things that broke the fast will take place in ruling and the fast will be considered to be broken. The author is now going to mention a few things which do not break the fast. The author he says, If the person does these things forgetfully, 
the things that we mentioned, or he does them whilst compelled, then the fast is not broken. And he's giving some examples now. If, for example, a fly comes to a person's throat, the person ends up swallowing a fly or some dust, then this doesn't break the fast. Why? Because the person didn't intend to do it. Or the person, he makes madmada. He puts water in his mouth when doing wudu, puts water in his nose when uh, doing wudu, and it goes into the throat. Then in this situation, it doesn't break the fast because it wasn't done intentionally. Or the person is thinking of something which arouses them, and it causes the person to ejaculate. So in this situation, the fasting is not going to be broken. Now, why is there a difference between thinking okay, and touching? Or sorry, thinking and looking. So looking, the ulama, they said that breaks the fast when the money comes out, when you ejaculate sperm. So you look at something which arouses you and you ejaculate, this will break your fast because you have the ability to turn away from that. Whereas fakkara, the person has thoughts which arouse them. More than often, you're unable to control these thoughts, right, at times. Uh, it could be a strong thought and the person ejaculates. So in this situation, uh, the fasting is not broken, as opposed to the situation of looking. If the person looks to that which arouses them and it causes them to ejaculate, then they will break their fast. However, this doesn't mean that a person should now sit and should think of things which arouse them whilst they are fasting to the extent that it's going to make them ejaculate. The author, he says, or the person puts in some medication through the male organ. This is something which is done uh, in the olden times, I don't know if it's still done now. It's a type of treatment that's put into the male organ. Uh, and uh, the author is saying it doesn't break the fast because it doesn't reach the stomach. Or the person has a wet dream, as we mentioned. If the person has a wet dream, then it's beyond their control. Or the person is overcome by vomit. It doesn't break them. It doesn't break the fast. The author he says, If a person eats, thinking that it was night time, but however it turned out to be the daytime, then the person has broken their fast. Why? Because the, the, the ruling is got given upon the reality of the situation. So the person was thinking that it was night, but it turned out to be day. So the situation here is that the person has broken their fast. Um, however, in a situation where a person, he is a bit confused, not sure, if Fajr has come about and he still thinks it's night, then in this situation the person, if they eat or drink, then the fasting is not broken. However, the person should take care, right? It's kind of easily known now when Fajr time is going to be. So you should stop at least a few moments before the Adhan of Fajr is going to be called and a person should take care not to go eating and drinking too close to the time of the Fajr Adhan, the Fajr time. So in this situation, man akala shakin fi tulu al fajr lam yafsud sawmu. In this situation, who the person was confused or doubtful as to whether fajr had come in or not, so the person was eating and drinking. Then in this situation, al asl biqa al layl. The ruling is given to that it was the night had remained, because the person didn't know whether or not fajr had come about. So for this, in this situation, the person's fast is not broken. Dorothy says, وَإِنْ أَكَلَ شَاكٍ فِي غُرُوبِ الشَّمْسِ فَسَدَ سَوْمُهُ If the person is confused or not sure as to whether the sun has set, then the person goes ahead and eats and he finds out later that actually the sun had not set, then this situation, the person would have broken their fast. So in any case, whether we're stopping our eating before the time of Fajr, we should be careful to ensure that we give enough time before we stop and the time of Fajr. And when we finish our fast, which we should ensure that the sun has in fact set. And it's quite easy for us today because we have the technology, we have the timetables, etc. And it's quite easy not to make those mistakes. Uh, we'll stop here, inshallah.